Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us, <clears throat> excuse me, for our MDA Engage ALS Symposium. My name is Nicole Petrowski. I am MDA's Community Education Specialist, and we appreciate you all joining us for our second day of presentations. I also want to thank again our supporters for this event, Alexian Pharmaceuticals, Amlix Pharmaceuticals, Apellus Pharmaceuticals, Biogen, and Psychokinetics and welcome any of their representatives who may be joining us today. We definitely appreciate your support. And in case you didn't miss yesterday's seminar, we did record it. And the entire symposium, including today and yesterday, will be available for on-demand viewing in a few weeks on mda.org. And I will be emailing all the registrants the link to view that recording when it is available. Here is a look at what we are going to be covering today. We have a busy afternoon planned with several speakers. Before I begin, I want to um, go over just a few reminders. Like I said earlier, we are recording today's event and we will be posting it to mda.org website. For those of you joining the event live, please know all phone lines have been muted and we will be having a Q&A session at the end of each presentation. So please utilize the Q&A icon to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of icons will appear and you just click on the Q&A icon and enter your question to host. And you don't need to wait till the presentation is over before submitting any questions. And feel free to use the chat feature as well during this seminar. If you have any comments, you um, just need to click on all panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see your chat line. So when you do type in your comment, make sure you click all panelists and attendees. And then you're gonna notice on the agenda, like yesterday, there are a few small breaks in between some speakers. So feel free to get a bite to eat or grab something to drink. I'm going to be checking the audio uh, for the next presenter. So you will hear us talking during that time. And then finally, I will be sending out a brief survey afterwards, and we would like to receive your feedback on what you heard yesterday and today. So we wanna make sure we're discussing pertinent issues. And so everyone's feedback is um, always useful when when we are um, considering what we're gonna do for 2022 programming. And we will be doing a drawing for two winners for a $20 Amazon e-gift card who do submit a survey. So thank you in advance for completing that. So today we are going to start our um, day off with, um, I'm sorry, with the role of the speech pathologist in managing bulbar symptoms in ALS. And with that, I would like to welcome Paige Nalapinski. She has worked in the speech language and swallowing disorders department at Massachusetts General Hospital for 29 years and is an adjunct instructor in communication science, sciences and disorders at the MGH Institute of Health Professions in Boston. She is a senior clinician and specializes in neurogenetic communication disorders, particularly ALS, PPA, and dysarthria. And she is a member of the MGH, MGH multidisciplinary ALS neuromuscular team. So Paige, thank you very much for being here today. And I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for having me. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the role of the speech pathologist in managing bulbar symptoms in ALS. So first, I wanna review um, the bulbar signs of ALS. <clears throat> and um, this is probably review for everybody, so I'll go through it quickly. But the bulbar region is the, the part, the muscles that we use for both speech and swallowing. <clears throat> and in patients with ALS, they have both upper motor neuron and lower, lower motor neuron signs. Um, patients who have PLS, and I know I already had a question about PLS, patients with that disease just have upper motor neuron signs. Um, so in the upper motor neuron realm, we see patients who have a spastic dysarthria, um, with dysarthria being changes in speech due to some neuromuscular changes. Um, spastic dysarthria is characterized by a strained and strangled vocal quality. So you'll hear a lot of tightness in the voice and that can range from very mild to very severe to the point where they can't even phonate. Patients will have a slow rate of speech and may have a phenomenon called laryngospasm. Um, and we'll talk about that later. So I'm not gonna get into that now. Um, with lower motor neuron signs, uh, patients have a flaccid dysarthria where the speech is impacted because of tongue and lip uh, mouth weakness. And um, they may have dysphagia signs earlier than they would see, swallowing problems earlier than patients who have upper motor neuron signs. And then they will have a weak cough. So those are some general signs and symptoms.
Um, so what's really important with intervention by the speech pathologist is we, we always want to stay one step ahead. And I'm sure this is the same with anybody who works with patients who have ALS. Um, staying a step ahead of the disease so that you can maximize symptom, minimize symptoms and maximize function is really what we aim for. Um, number one thing we think about um, because of the safety aspect is secretion management and dysphagia management. So being able to maintain nutrition orally um, and if that's not possible, um, transitioning to non-oral nutrition, if that's within the patient's goals of care. Um, managing laryngospasm, and again, I'll talk about that more later. Um, uh, discussing nutrition within the patient's goals of care, you know, is the patient interested in a gastrostomy tube or is that not an option for them and it's their choice, but providing education so that they're making uh, a choice based on um, good information. Hmm, my audio is cutting in and out. Let's see. I don't have I anything. You. I hear you just fine. Okay, I don't have anything else going on in my computer, so. No, <laughs> you're okay. Um, we discuss communication strategies as the patient exhibits changes in their bulbar function. Um, cognitive changes, which can be an issue for patients um, at, as the disease progresses, or actually it could be an initial symptom. Some patients present first with a frontotemporal dementia, which is sort of on a spectrum of possibilities um, with motor neuron disease. Um, we talk about treatments and frameworks of care, and then care themes for the speech pathologist. And we're going to sort of address each of these as we move along. So secretion management, um, it, you know, it, it can be very challenging. Um, so patients have thin uh, copious oral saliva. Um, they may have trouble managing it in their mouth because of weakness. <clears throat> and so there are three ways to address this. One is pharmacological. There are a lot of medications out there that can help address um, copious oral saliva um, and mucus. However, it really takes some, some finessing. Um, some patients, you, know, you don't want to get them overly dry um, and kind of finding the right combination, the right time of day to, to manage um, is, is critical. So it's an ongoing process. Um, and it's really imperative that the patients kind of communicate to their care providers if, if something's not working, because you can tweak the doses and the timing and things to, to really try and get that under control. There are also procedural um, possibilities. <clears throat> um, and this is sort of a last line uh, of, of approach to, to managing the secretions, but some patients do have Botox, which comes with its own um, possible side effects, um, or radiation therapy, um, where they sort of try and stop secretion management at the level of the um, salivary glands. Um, so there's a sort of extreme and it, it requires um, you know, medical intervention, but if the patient is really suffering because of the copious secretions, these are possibilities. And the third is equipment. Um, so having things like an oral suction device, like is pictured here, um, where the, the patient has trouble with positioning, you know, they may be able to use that to get at secretions that are sitting back in the throat or accessing um, tilting power wheelchairs, neck supports, things that help so that the secretions aren't either falling out of their mouths or spilling back into their throats <clears throat> um, and, and causing them to choke. All right, um, so some non-pharmacological uh, ways of managing the secretions can be, you know, especially if these are thick, tenacious secretions, which is sort of the opposite of the pr problem with them running out of your mouth. Uh, again, there's other pharmacological interventions, but non-pharmacological um, approaches might be uh, maintaining really good hydration so that you still have those secretions, <clears throat> but they're not so thick and tenacious that you can't move them along. Um, being cautious and conscious about alcohol and caffeine intake, which can dry you and your secretions out. Reducing dairy. Some patients are very susceptible to um, enzymes in the dairy products that make their secretions very thick, and they can even see that right after eating. And then using things, um, natural, uh, uh, natural juices and things to help manage secretions. So papaya, pineapple, and citrus for some patients can be really effective. Um, and then some patients, if their cough is weak, so the, let's say even if you get the secretions under control with regard to uh, how thick or thin they are, it can be really hard for patients to move them along. So they can kind of sit in no man's land here, um, basically causing like a, um, 
you know, a, a clogged drain and it makes it hard to breathe. It makes it hard to swallow around the secretions. Um, whoops, I thought I got mind of its own here. Where'd it go? Um, so uh, getting equipment in place as necessary, like a cough assist machine or an anaxiflator, depending on where in the country you are, they call them different things. But it's a machine that um, kind of does the work of coughing for the patient. Whoa, this is like going crazy here. Where'd it go? Sorry. All right. Um, all right. And then it's really important, and I talk a lot about this with our patients, as does everybody on our team, oral care is critical. Um, if patients have a lot of uh, secretions dried in their mouth, uh, that, that's a breeding ground for, for um, infection. So we don't want the, the colonized secretions to then drop down into the throat being carried either by anything taken by mouth or by saliva. Um, so it's imperative that the patient has good oral hygiene, oral hygiene, and that can be done through a number of different um, devices mentioned here, um, water pick, um, swab sticks, uh, paradex, mouthwash, if that's appropriate, a tongue scraper, if, if regular toothbrushing is not working for you. And if you have some issues with your mouth, if you notice dry crusted secretions and things, it's really important to have a nurse or a physician look in your mouth to be sure that you don't have thrush um, because that needs a different kind of treatment than just simple mouth, normal mouth care. <clears throat> and I, there's a misperception I've seen, you know, periodically from patients that they think because they're not eating, they don't need to brush their teeth and take care of their mouth because there's not food in there. Certainly food is not going to be an issue, but still, even with secretions, you can have a buildup of um, bacteria that can lead to problems if you're aspirating your secretions. So oral care is imperative, even if you're not taking anything in by mouth. <clears throat> All right, the next section we're gonna talk about is dysphagia, which is trouble with, with swallowing, and or, or with more than swallowing, it's with preparing the food to swallow and swallowing itself. And it often parallels speech problems because the same issues you're having in creating your speech, if you have weakness in the tongue, stiffness because of spasticity, in the tongue or um, muscles in the throat, those are the same issues that can lead to trouble with, with managing foods in the mouth and swallowing. Um, swallowing problems can be tied to respiratory decline or to speech decline or to a combination. So you may have completely intact speech with regard to the precision and accuracy of the muscles, but really struggle for breath support. And if you're constantly breathing hard, especially when you eat, the effort of trying to take in a deep breath while you're simultaneously chewing or trying to organize a sip of liquid <clears throat> can, can be tricky. Um, or if you're trying to eat while you're on BiPAP. <clears throat> so it takes a lot of coordination and attention and focus. Um, it can be done with, for most people, but it, but it really takes work. Swallowing can change very quickly. So it's something we always wanna be um, following, watching the patient eat and drink, and making sure that they know that they can reach out if they detect any problem or are worried that something might be changing. So having really access to um, just asking questions from the healthcare providers is, is imperative. <clears throat> Um, if there's any suspicion for dysphagia, um, a video fluoroscopic swallowing study can be done to rule out silent aspiration. So aspiration is when any material that doesn't belong in the airway gets into the airway and then below the vocal cords. Um, be, below the vocal cords is sort of an area of danger because then, especially if you don't have a strong cough, your possibility of getting something in and out, up and out um, is diminished. And <clears throat> aspiration, so things getting into the lungs that don't belong there put you at a high risk for infection or developing a pneumonia. So we want to avoid that if at all possible. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, um, and we can't see inside with our eyes. Um, so lots of times we do a video swallow study in order to be able to objectively assess what's going on. And there's this little um, photo here at the bottom, uh, which I'm not going to describe all the anatomy and physiology right now, but this person is taking a sip probably of a thin liquid that has some barium mixed in so you can see it. And everything should be going down into the esophagus, but this little um, little blip of black here, that's aspiration or, or is high potential to be aspiration. It's such a small picture. I can't see exactly where it is, but um, that material is headed the wrong direction. <clears throat> and we want to see how a patient's doing. Are they silently aspirating? So if you eat or drink and things go the wrong way and your body doesn't respond normally with a cough, that's silent aspiration. 
Um, or some of our patients who have a lot of spasticity in the system might actually be hyper responsive. So they, we, we do a video swallow, trying to determine the safest strategies and consistencies for a patient to take because they're coughing a lot. And we look and see, and in fact, they aren't even aspirating, um, but their, their body is uh, hyper reflexive. It's over responding to things that even kind of get near the upper airway. So this study allows us to take the guesswork out of what's happening to try different strategies and consistencies where we can actually see the function. I won't usually recommend this study for patients that I can, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> that have seem to do really well if they're concentrating. Um, the reason for that is if a patient comes into the radiology suite and it's a very controlled setting, I'm giving them a, a very controlled bolus size, they're eating and drinking at the pace that is necessary for our study. And if they have very mild problems, I might not see anything happening. Um, so we first try your know, behavioral management, you know, making sure that you're concentrating, taking small sips and bites. But if, if everything that we're recommending doesn't seem to be working or there's some suspicion for aspiration, we'll recommend the study. So the timing of that um, is, is important. <clears throat> So with regard to dysphagia, some early eating problems that we see are more in the mouth, in the oral phase. Um, so if a patient is um, having trouble manipulating the food in their mouth, um, we might try some positional things, um, tucking the chin slightly um, or even fully, but even slightly uh, allows the airway to be a little more closed. A head extended, which is a position that frequently we will drink in, but that really is an open airway position. That's the position you put somebody's head in if you want to maximize their airway. We don't want your airway wide open while you're drinking, so a slight chin tuck can, can help protect the airway. For some patients, using a straw can be really helpful because it keeps the liquid really contained and some patients are able to, to you know, get the appropriate size in their mouth, but straws can really be a problem for other people. It gets the liquid back quite far in the oral cavity, doesn't give you as much time to prepare to swallow, um, doesn't give you the sensation as the liquid goes through the mouth, which might help you to recruit a faster swallow. So it, with all of these, you know, it's not one size fits all. You need to be assessed to figure out what works best given your symptomatology. Um, for some patients, a lot of patients, using two swallows per bite might really be helpful because it clears the food that's sitting on the back of the tongue and the upper part of the throat. Um, if you're having to do more than two swallows per bite, we really want to manage the consistency of the food. So as it's not too fatiguing, if you're having to swallow four and five times for every bite, you're gonna get tired really fast. So what can we change to, to make that easier? It's not a good idea, number four here, to wash foods down with liquids. Um, most of our patients, Many of our patients have trouble with liquids before they have trouble with solids. Um, if, if it is the swallowing mechanism itself that's a problem and not the oral manipulation. So if you have a solid in your mouth and you chew and you feel like there's some residue and you go to try and rinse it down with the liquid, your risk of aspirating the liquid and pulling a little bit of food particles along with it um, is sort of increased. So again, we want to look, take every patient individually, but <clears throat> we usually recommend, you know, have a bite of food, have a sip of liquid, or for some patients, eat your whole meal and then have something to drink afterward. Mixing the two <clears throat> is hard. Um, and I think it's important for everybody, not just our patients, but everybody to learn choking first aid. What used to be the Heimlich maneuver, you know, it works. Um, I really say to all of my patients, you should never be putting anything in your mouth that is <clears throat> the size that it would block your airway if it got away from you. Um, you know, if you have any issues with tongue control, is a possibility of while you're chewing, things get away. So you want to be sure that it's not the size that it's going to block your airway. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you think of one of those little red and white mint flat candies, that's a perfect choking size. You want that to be cut in three or four bites. So that, if, again, if it gets away from you, you still might be miserable, but it's not going to completely occlude your airway. <clears throat> Um, dietary consistency changes are sort of our first go-to to make um, the swallow, uh, maintain swallow safety. 
Changing to a soft diet not only makes it easier to chew and swallow the food, but it takes a lot less um, work on the patient's part. Um, and I sometimes will even say, you know, have, have a big chewy breakfast, you know, a bagel sandwich for breakfast, but by dinner time, favor something that's a lot less work when you're getting fatigued. You still want the calorie, and, uh, you know, in the calorie balance to be there. You've got to have just as many throughout the day, but it doesn't have to be as much work. Um, we want to make sure you're able to maintain your liquid intake and stay hydrated. So figuring out how best to do that. Um, different consistencies of liquids um, might be easier for you than others. For many of our patients, um, things that are naturally thick or thickened with um, an additive can make swallowing a whole lot easier because the liquid slows down enough to allow you to be in control. And if a little gets away, it's a thick, little thicker so it doesn't get into tiny little nooks and crannies to be aspirated. Eating high calorie, you know, calorie dense foods um, is really important. Every bite that goes in the mouth should be worth the effort that's put into getting it into the stomach. Um, and increasing the sensory input, uh, like taste, temperature, and texture can really help to get that swallow um, recruited a little bit faster. Um, frequently, water is really hard for patients, especially, you know, and if I ask them, sure enough, it's water that's room temperature, has no taste, no temperature, no bubbles, no nothing. It's really hard to, to uh, get that swallow rolling if you don't get a, as much information, sensory input. That's another reason our secretions are easily uh, choked on is because we don't taste them. They build up in little amounts um, and suddenly, you know, a drip has gone down and kind of gets you. So, um, it, but you can't really change your secretions um, in terms of texture and temperature and taste. <clears throat> Um, so, and for some patients, uh, there is a, a breathing, an exercise, a little device called an EMST. It's an expiratory muscle strength trainer. These um, can be really nicely used in patients who are able to have frequent in-person check-ins with a speech pathologist or respiratory or physical therapist, um, but they require frequent check-in because it's really important that they are um, calibrated frequently and we have to be sure patients are using them properly. Um, it's not that it's dangerous that they're used improperly, but um, it, they really won't give you any benefit. So in order for a patient to even be a candidate for using um, this, this exercise, which really works to um, help maintain the strength of a cough, um, the patient must have a forced or slow vital capacity of at least 65%, well, greater than 65%. So if, if you are in a, um, working with a speech pathologist, let's say, who doesn't have the ability to test for forced vital capacity, you shouldn't be doing these exercises. Um, it needs to be really washed carefully. Um, and the clinician needs to be able to collect outcomes. So this is a discussion to have with your clinician, but this is not for everybody for sure. All right, so laryngospasm. This is one of these um, phenomenons that we see in patients who have spasticity. So if you're somebody who um, you know, has those upper motor neuron signs and when the doctor tests your reflexes, they're hyperactive. Laryngospasm is a hyperactive response of the vocal cords. So in your throat, in this little diagram down here, we can see that if we, if we took a camera and looked in, you know, down your nose and into your throat, we would see these are your vocal cords here. And your vocal cords, um, when you're breathing, they should be open so that you can get air in. And when you swallow, they close for a second, like here, so that you food doesn't go into your airway. And there's a lot more going on than is shown in these two pictures. This is a pretty simple diagram, diagram here. But in, laryngospa in a normal swallow that doesn't have spasticity or laryngospasm, if I take a sip of liquid and a tiny bit goes the wrong way, I'm going to cough my head off. My vocal cords are going to slam together <coughs> while I'm coughing. It's a level of protection for my airway, which sits below my vocal cords. If a patient has laryngospasm, they don't have a normal response. They have a hyperactive response. So those vocal cords slam together and stay shut for a few seconds. So <gasps> you kind of hear that, feel that gasping and wheezing sound. It's not that food or liquid is blocking the airway, but the vocal cords themselves are in spasm. And it doesn't feel like a cramp in, in that, like a, like a charley horse in your leg, but it's, it is a, basically a cramp of your voice box, your airway with your cords together so you cannot get a normal breath in. You may feel like you've got like a pinhole area to breathe through. 
it's important to think for a second that wasn't a bite of chicken that's blocking my airway uh, but as long assuming it was something you know lots of times it's saliva or a little sip of liquid there are particular triggers i'll talk about in a moment but if it's just this spasm just and it feels very frightening um what you want to do is help facilitate relaxation so the cords open back up and you can take a nice deep breath so um, it's a very scary and unsettling feeling. And many times, the first time it happens, if the patient isn't aware that it might happen and hasn't heard about it, it's a frequent reason why patients call 911. Um, they don't know what's happening. And by the time the ambulance gets there, like, oh, I'm fine now. I don't know what the heck that was, but I could not breathe for a few minutes. Probably was seconds, but a few seconds not breathing can be really frightening. Um, so I, if I see a patient who has any signs of spasticity, like the um, strange strangled vocal quality, real slowness of speech, I will talk to them about laryngospasm, even if they haven't had the symptom, just so if it happens, they're like, oh, this is what she was talking about. Not that it's still not going to be scary, but it's a whole lot less scary, at least if you've heard about it and talked about it. What you want to do if it happens is facilitate relaxation. And the more you're like this, the longer it's going to last. We all tend to hold a lot of stress here and a lot of tension here. Um, and this kind of is just adding to that. Um, and in our patients, it very rarely is it actually dangerous. Um, it rarely lasts for over a minute. But again, a minute or even 20 seconds of not being able to breathe is really a scary feeling. So what you want to do is one of several strategies. Um, and this is where you know, your friends and family can really be helpful to kind of coach you through this the first few times you're getting used to it. Um, you wanna change the posture of your, your throat and your mouth. And that's really the main thing. A lot of my patients say the thing that works best for them is using like a yoga breathing. So you're gonna you know, just try and completely relax. If you're not already sitting down, sit so that you can kind of ragdoll sit. Um, and either some people feel like their head is they do better when their head is really back, which opens their airway. Other people see they feel more relaxed with their, with their chin forward. So whatever works positionally, you wanna take a slow breath in through the nose, pucker out through the lips like a yoga breath. And just do that for a good minute, minute and a half until you feel relaxed. Some people say, I can't even take a breath in through my nose. Everything is so tight, I'm like in lockdown. And in that case, what helps to sort of start the process of relaxation is trying to hum. So it won't sound like a beautiful hum, like a melodic hum. It'll sound like a growl or a grinding sound, but <clears throat> you're just trying to get those vocal cords to move and then you'll feel them relax and you'll be able to get a breath. But again, you wanna then go into that yoga breathing um, or breathing through a straw, again, which is a very slow breathing. That's why the straw makes you, you can't gasp, it's slow. Um, you get through that slow, relaxed breathing until you feel like the whole area has completely relaxed. You don't want to take anything to drink. That's not going to help clear this. And it's sort of adding fuel to the fire because everything is in lockdown mode. So all the, um, the precise movements that need to happen for a swallow, none of that can happen. So you're just going to be pouring liquid. It's not going to go to your airway because your airway is closed. But once your airway opens back up, you're at risk for aspirating. So nothing to eat or drink until you feel like it's completely relaxed. Um, there are, let's see, do I have, oh, no, I'm going to go back. Um, there are triggers that people tend to find for laryngospasm. Um, and it's different from patient to patient, but some common triggers are acidic foods like, you know, a vinegary salad dressing, red wine, um, things from um, um, spicy foods. Uh, some, for some people really sweet things like, a, like peppermint um, or like a really sweet milk chocolate. Uh, and it's, again, different for everybody. Some people, um, carbonation. It can even happen, and this tells us it's a sensory thing. It can even happen from environmental um, triggers. Like if you uh, have somebody cleaning with ammonia or bleach near you or a really strong aftershave or perfume, those sorts of things can trigger it as well. So that tells us it's not things blocking your airway because those things aren't even you know, in your mouth. They're just uh, sensory stimulation that's making your body over respond. <clears throat> All right. 
So um, G-tube in ALS, you know, it's, this is again a personal uh, decision, um, but it's really important that as healthcare providers, we give you the right information so that you can make your decision about a feeding tube and the timing of the feeding tube if you decide to get one based on fact and not fiction. Um, so AAN uh, practice parameters. So there are no studies of ALS specific indications for the timing of PEG or feeding tube insertion although patients with dysphagia will possibly be exposed to less risk if the PEG is placed when FVC, so the breathing score, is above 50%. So, um, you know, it depends sometimes on your facility, the surgeons, and what risk they're willing to take. So the considerations for when to get a feeding tube, um, if, you're, if you decide you want one, it, there are sort of basically three reasons why patients would get a feeding tube. One is their, their bulbar dysfunction. So their, their swallowing and secretion management and hydration are becoming an issue because their swallowing problems are advancing. Respiratory decline. So again, if their vital capacity is less than 50%, um, or if they become very short of breath with, with very simple tasks, their risk of doing well in a surgery from a respiratory standpoint goes up, or the risk, the risk goes up, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's something else we wanna consider. You may have no swallowing problems at all, but because of your breathing, if you think eventually you would want a feeding tube if your swallow declines, you need to do it while your respiratory status is, is will we'll take the surgery. And then weight loss. We have some patients that become hypermetabolic. Their, their metabolism just picks up to the point where they cannot possibly eat enough unless they sit and eat 24 seven. And most people, even though they love to eat, would rather do a few other things during the day. So patients, again, they may have fine breathing, fine swallowing, but they're still losing weight. They just cannot keep up with their metabolism. So that's, they may um, continue to eat a normal diet, but supplement with, um, with tube feeds to sort of double their calorie intake. Um, other considerations are, you know, if the appetite is declining, we do have patients who completely lose their appetite. They just aren't interested, but, but they want to keep going. So they need to get the nutrition in somehow. And for some patients, depending on their living situation, if they're unable to feed themselves, um, it can be really challenging to have somebody there to help them three meals a day. Those same patients might have a really hard time giving themselves tube feeds. So, you know, it, it's, it's not a simple, well, if you can't feed yourself, we're gonna give you tube feeds. Somebody has to administer those as well, um, but, it, but it can factor into the decision and the timing. All right, so with regard to patient and family education regarding anything um, related to speech pathology uh, intervention in patients with ALS, uh, for me, what's really critical is that I'm always honest. You know, if you ask me a question, even if I know you're gonna hate the answer, I'm gonna answer it honestly. Um, but I also stay positive. You know, we are, our, our intervention is hopefully helping patients to live as high quality of life as they can for as long as they can or want to. And it's, you know, it's really important to stay positive um, and focus on skills that you do have and maximizing them, not always focusing on the negative. Um, and I think that's really makes patients want to come back and continue care and intervention, um, makes them understand that there is good quality to their life um, and helping meet them where they are. Um, give, empowering them to do what they can, but understanding if they make a decision um, that even it wouldn't be your decision, it's their decision. And we have to be unbiased and respect and honor decisions. Um, we can't you know, try and change patients' minds, but giving them the information to make that choice. So communication, of course, is a big part of speech pathology. <clears throat> um, and obviously our patients with both upper and lower motor neuron involvement in the bulbar region can have a significant hard, significantly hard time with speaking as the disease progresses. Um, we can't, it's not like a stroke patient where I can give you a lot of exercises to make the muscles get stronger and better. Um, there's going to be continued decline in function. So again, as I said, first off, it's trying to stay a step ahead is critical. Um, so most of what we recommend is um, strategies, modification of things that you're doing to maximize the function that you do have um, when the patient is still able to speak. So for some patients, it's maintain a slow speaking rate. 
So typically, if a patient has spasticity, they are speaking slowly. They can't make themselves go faster. But with the patients with a flaccid dysarthria or lower motor neuron dysarthria, um, their muscles aren't working well in terms of you know, making those points of contact, but their rate of speech still might be really fast. So simply talking about rate and practicing a slower rate of speech allows them, their muscles, the time um, to make more specific and um, uh, good contact so that their speech may sound better. A huge one, thinking about conserving energy. Um, I always give the analogy that you know, you've got a cup of good function in your lips, tongue, throat, muscles, et cetera, for the day. And it's your choice as to how you want to use them. But by nine o'clock at night, you're pretty much on empty. And overnight, you'll, you'll fill back up pretty close to the top. And that changes as to how full you are over the course of the disease. But if you get up in the morning and you have a bagel sandwich, and then you talk on the phone for two hours to your cousin, and then you have um, a roast beef sub, and, and then you wanted to go to a meeting, a town hall meeting and talk at seven o'clock tonight, you're done, like you're out of, your cup is empty. <clears throat> so think about, I wanna have plenty of calories always, but can I have a big um, bowl of clam chowder and that's a whole lot less work? I'll throw it in the blender so I don't even have to chew the clams. And then I'm gonna rest for a while and I'm gonna um, then work on the computer and I'm going to then go to my town hall meeting and have plenty of energy left to ask questions. So thinking about energy conservation, using what you've got for things that are important to you. <clears throat> And again, it's your, what's important to you, only you know, but, but you need to plan ahead if there's something you want to do later in the day. Simple things like when COVID is over, um, going out to brunch with your friends rather than dinner um, can make a big difference. You can still socialize and eat, although you want to be careful doing those. But if you go out earlier in the day, that, that could work better. Or if you're going out at night with your friends for dinner, and the whole purpose is to to meet up with your friends and chat with them, then eat at home. So when you're together, you can focus on talking with your friends and not trying to eat or worrying about choking in front of them because you're trying to do too many things at once. Um, develop breakdown resolution strategies. So if things are not going well with regard to talking, um, if, you, you're, if your spouse or child or friend is in the room with you and your speech is starting to decline, you know, have a little, you know, old cow bonnet, have some symbol that they let you know that, you know, you're starting to, things are starting to, to fall apart a bit. So then you, that raises your awareness. I need to slow down, use shorter phrases, answer with one or two words rather than a whole big sentence. Um, tell your friend, oh, tell the story about Johnny rather than you telling the story you thought of it, but the friend can, can give the story for you. So thinking about how to make your speech better or preserve it as long as possible over the course of the day. And then thinking about specific strategies like slowing your rate, um, like I spoke of earlier, exaggerating. Now, I don't always want to speak like this over doing it, it would sound silly coming from me. But simply exaggerating the movements of speech, if you have weakness in your lips and tongue, can go a long way to making your speech sound a lot better. The problem is it's really fatiguing. So you can't do that every time you speak all day. So again, this thinking about how you want to use your energy during the day Exaggerating your speech can really work for short periods several times during the day, but not all day. Um, and being sure to include final consonants, you know, those sounds we tend to kind of lose it at the end. Lose it at the end, you know, really e exaggerating that final consonant that makes the word really clear to our conversational partner. Um, Patient autonomy is something that is, is critical in when we think about working with patients with ALS, whether it's um, speech pathologists and anybody who works on the team. And we understand that the loss of control is a huge challenge in dealing with, with the disease. Um, and we want to you know, do anything we can to help you stay in control. Um, many patients state that milestones like 
um, going into an electric wheelchair, beginning to use augmentative communication like a boogie board, getting a G-tube, all these things that we think of, oh, they're great, but patients feel like, oh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I hate the idea because it means I'm giving in to the disease. Um, so we want to help you like, embrace that technology or that choice if, if you decide to do it and understand that you know, it can really help you maximize your quality of life depending on what your quality of life is. And that, that is, the ultimate, again, ultimately your choice. So our goal is to empower and prepare patients when they're making the decision. So you can make an informed decision. You can anticipate the next functional decline and plan ahead. This is really hard. I, I think when I first started a long time ago, for me, being really proactive and talking about the next symptom that I expect they'll be seeing is really hard um, as a, a care provider. And I know it's hard as a patient to hear it as well, but it allows you that time to make decisions and be more autonomous. So for example, the first time I meet someone in clinic, they may have just gotten the diagnosis. Their speech sounds great, or I'm seeing very subtle changes. That's the time for me to introduce um, message and voice banking. That may not have been on your mind at all yet because you have a foot drop and you may not ever need the, the, the voice you recorded but it's the time to do it when things sound good. But boy, it's a slap in the face sometimes. I, I, you know, I try to be very sensitive to how they're doing with, with hearing the diagnosis and coping with the timing. But even you know, when I'm trying my hardest, sometimes it just kind of comes out of left field and patients aren't prepared for it. And then I back off and bring it up another time, but that anticipating um, is, is important creating a care team dynamic that's centered around the patient and caregivers is something we always think about um, as, on the whole team um, so that the patient and family are directing the care and we're, we're, everybody is comfortable asking questions, sort of knows who the players are, you know how to, who to reach out to, or if you don't, you know who you can reach out to, who will figure it out. Um, optimizing sources of strength and support. And these may be in your community, it may be on our staff, it may be somebody in your family, um, and if you don't have anybody, we can help find somebody who will be a support to you and to your family. And then identifying and addressing barriers to care, whether they're financial, psychosocial, etc. cetera. Um, I know in Boston, we have some wonderful organizations, um, uh, MDA being one of them, um, but there are a number of other ones that have, um, that are great resources to our families um, for, you know, in-home care, um, durable medical devices, all kinds of things. What are we doing with time? Okay. Um, all right, so speech therapy itself, everybody says, oh, let's just let's start doing speech therapy. I can come three times a week. I want to intervene early, but unfortunately, um, traditional therapy, again, like something I do with a patient who has a stroke or something, is, is not going to be helpful. So I'm going to focus on function what you have that's working well and maximize it. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, things that interfere with communication. So, and again, this is all sort of manipulating your environment and learning some strategies that you can actually physically do, but more of it is sort of how to, to make the environment as user-friendly as possible. So number one, gonna minimize environmental impediments. So if, if you are working on Zoom calls um, with, and you're still working and working on Zoom calls, get rid of any background noise. So you're not competing with other noise. Even if you're speaking just with your spouse, turn off the room air conditioner, mute the TV. Um, if if there, somebody is drilling out on the sidewalk, go to another room. Don't try and fight over loud environmental sounds. And also be aware of the lighting. Um, we really rely on each, on what we call speech reading. So watching my facial expressions, my lips and tongue, you know, the whole picture makes it easier for communication. And I think we've all seen what, now that we're wearing masks so often, it's harder to understand people who are wearing a mask, even if their speech is perfect, let alone if you have some dysarthria. So making sure that I, you know, I, I'm facing you, there's good light on my face, um, I don't have a mask if, if I'm in an environment where I can take it off, like on Zoom or, or outside. Um, making sure, and this is always a tricky one, that your conversational par partners have good hearing or maximizing their hearing. I frequently will recommend when I see interaction between spouses that one of the two spouses, maybe they should get their hearing tested. 
it's so much work for the patient with ALS to be constantly trying to raise their volume. And, it, and if it's obvious to me that that is an issue because their partner can't hear, um, you know, let's share some responsibility here. Um, determining the context. This, a little trick that I tell patients who have a lot of trouble with speech is if you're having a conversation and you suddenly think, oh, you know, you're talking about what we're going to have for dinner tomorrow night. And then in your mind, you shift and think, oh, I need to call my mother. Have some, some little symbol that, or signal that lets the conversational partner know you're going to completely be shifting gears like change or, you know, saw anything. Because what happens is when I'm working hard as your conversational partner to understand you, and we're talking about tomorrow night's dinner, I'm thinking foods in my head, or maybe I'm thinking cooking equipment, and I've got some vocabulary while you're talking, I'm, I'm accessing this vocabulary to help me understand what you're saying. You shift to phone calling my mother, and it's no longer computing, um, because I'm not thinking with the right vocabulary in mind. So to change, letting me know that there's a change of context can really help me as your conversational partner to participate fully. And then if pa the patient is rapidly progressing or even not rapidly progressing, even with message banking now, anytime it's really important to engage the families and patients thinking about augmentative communication. Um, and, you know, depending on what your other physical um, capacities are, Things like a boogie board. I think a lot of people are familiar with these now, these great little things that you, you write with a stylus and then you push a button and it disappears. Um, doesn't have a voice output, but it's a cr great quick and dirty thing to have with you um, for writing messages in, if your speech isn't well understood. Um, iPads and iPhones and all kinds of tablets now have fabulous uh, applications for text to speech. Some of them are very simple, just you know, you put in the word, it says the word. Others have icons and emojis and have um, pictures and you know you can make it as simple or as complex as you want. Um, and speech pathologists can help kind of figure out a device that works for you given your um, you know, you know, what your speech deficits are, if you're having any cognitive changes, what your conversational partner's um, level of understanding and hearing is. Um, things like this, this is sort of more, we call low tech, um, it, because it's not like a computer device, but this is called an e-tran, and it's a eye gaze system, not computer based, where your conversational partner can see, it, it takes a little work to, it's not hard to learn, but, but it, it does take a little training to get to use this. And then our high tech, the um, more eye gaze devices that are devices that allow you um, with completely hands free. Um, and you can see in this patient here has um, BiPAP on and with trach and vent patients as well. You can access a patient, basically a touch screen here with your eyes to communicate the same way you would with a text to speech device, except that it's um, driven with uh, eye control. And patients can. Um, change their environment, turn off and on lights, turn off and on the TV, drive their wheelchair, all kinds of things with these eye gaze systems. Um, it's important that patients are assessed for the right eye gaze system or the right communication system in general by somebody who has awareness of the, the types of devices and the pitfalls of each of them, because again, not one size fits all. Um, so depending on where you are, um, getting help on the, what the resources are. Um, we'll, we'll make that go smoothly. Oral motor exercises. I get this question all the time. Oh, shouldn't I be doing exercises? Typical oral motor exercises like strengthening, you know, holding your tongue against a tongue depressor or a spoon and pushing as hard as you can for 50 reps. That's not going to help. What that does is that eats at this strength that you use for the day. It does something that's not going to buy you. It's not going to hurt you. You know, tomorrow you're going to come back to where you were before, but you don't recuperate as quickly. And exercises trying to strengthen the muscles are going to make those muscles very tired much faster. So instead, you want to practice like over articulation and exaggeration and maximizing muscle movement in real life activities like talking and eating. We might, for a patient who has um, either no or very, very mild um, 
involvement of the lips and tongue. I might give some gentle stre stretching exercises, um, but I'm not gonna ever give strengthening exercises. Um, and again, once there's any uh, weakness or involvement in the ball bar muscles, I will have the patient not do the exercises because again, they're getting a lot of use of those muscles every time they swallow their saliva, talk, you know, yawn, everything. Uh, final area I'm going to touch on here is our cognitive changes. And it, it used to be that we, we didn't realize how prevalent cognitive changes or dementia was in patients who have ALS. Um, and there is this um, sim syndrome, uh, frontotemporal dementia, which is a, a, a classification of dementias where the patients may have um, significant problems with language, it's primary progressive aphasia, or more behavioral changes. Um, and it's sort of on a spectrum, it can be on a spectrum with ALS. So a patient may present with these behavioral or speech cha language changes trouble with word finding and sentence structure and things, and then later have signs of um, the more motor signs of ALS, or we can have a patient that has ALS and then starts to develop changes in their, their um, memory and speech and th uh, language access and things. Um, and we do screen for that um, in, in clinic. Um, and it's important to stay on top of that because especially if the patient has behavioral issues um, with their, their ALS, uh, you know, there are things where, where decisions can be really dangerous um, if a patient isn't making good decisions. So we really want to be sure that we're um, aware of behavioral changes and changes in problem solving and decision making with our patients. Um, patients and family education is, is critical if we notice the patient is having cognitive changes. Um, one of the tools we use, it's called the ALS CBS Cognitive Behavioral Screen. Part of the little screening tool is given to a patient looking at their attention and memory and decision making. The other portion is given to a caregiver that asks questions about changes in behavior, um, habits, and things like that, so we can kind of screen and watch for changes. If a patient does develop cognitive changes, um, they need to really be addressed head on. And it's really important long-term planning and goals of care might be very different in a patient with ALS who develops significant cognitive changes than it would be if they had normal cognition. So it's important that we, we bring up this issue um, if it's noted or of concern to a family. Some implications for cognitive impairment um, that need to be rescreened. If you notice a decreased insight, regarding um, you know, the risk of aspiration, so eating things that are inappropriate, even though they've been instructed uh, and, and have worked a lot on their swallowing, the degree of speech impairment, like they don't realize how bad their speech is and they don't use any strategies to try and compensate. They have trouble using complex augmentative communication devices. Um, they can't multitask. They have poor pragmatics and pragmatics is the way you interact with other people. So they may say things inappropriately or not take turns when they're chatting, um, just normal, normal ways of interacting. And we see poor carryover of strategies. So you can't simply teach somebody um, how to use a walker or, or a cane because they won't carry that over to use it safely um, in the future. So it does have a significant impact. Okay, so I'm going to, I think Control can go back to Nicole now um, on the screen here. Um, but uh, we have, I think, about 10 minutes for questions. And let's see. Oh, I see there are questions in here. Hi, Paige. Okay, thank you. I had to find that button myself. All right. Um, so I kind of wanted to just, I didn't know if you could speak to the comment that was in the chat about the 67-year-old um, dad with, P, um, with PLS. The speech and muscle strength is deteriorating, and he was just curious, um, is there any medication in the pipeline for something that is affecting your speech? Yeah, so I don't know about in the pipeline. Um, I, um, I don't know if there's, I think there's maybe somebody on this um, speaking later today who can address that. Um, I, I know with, um, let me look at the question I saw it. Let me just look at it so I can address it. Um, sorry, I'm just reading this again real fast. So, you know, again, if, if in terms of medications coming down the road, I don't know. Um, we do see a lot of patients with PLS um, 
and unfortunately, the the muscle, the medications like baclofen that are good for spasticity in general don't really work on the bulbar region. So, um, you know, it's there. There aren't great answers for that. And things like Botox, which can help to relax the muscles, the problem with that is they relax the muscles so much that then you can't use them for functional for doing functional things. Like if I, I've had patients who have, oh, why don't I get Botox in my tongue? Well, your tongue is has spasticity and it's stiff because of the spasticity. And so it's not moving um, the same with the vocal cords, but if we make those completely weak by putting in the Botox, then you can't swallow and you can't talk because you, it's completely flaccid. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's not a good exchange. Um, with a more advanced PLS with that spasticity, again, especially if it impacts the vocal cord function, it really patients do have to go to an augmentative device to, to supplement speech because at least at this time, there really aren't great medications or, or other um, interactions that, that are successful at overcoming that. Okay. Can EMST still be useful in patients who feed exclusively via a feeding tube? So the, the EMST um, is is all about trying to maintain the strength of the cough. So um, if the patient has good breathing and has a feeding tube, again, it depends on why the patient has the feeding tube. I guess that's the answer to the question. If it's a patient who has the feeding tube um, because the swallowing is weak, but their respiratory muscles are still good, they may benefit from EMST. Um, so it, it really, it, again, it's patient by patient, but but those are not mutually exclusive. Okay. Um, and we have a person on the line that said, what did you say the question um, was for cognitive tests for caregiver and patient? Do you remember that? Oh, so it's called the um, ALS CBS. It's the Cognitive Behavioral Screen. Okay. And again, it's two parts. The part that's for the, the family asks questions like, um, you know, is the patient, um, you know, I won't be able to think of any questions now, of course, but um, does the patient get angry more easily? Is the patient um, eating very different diet than they used to for odd reasons? Um, you know, a sudden propensity for sweets or, um, you know, but questions about just general behavior. Um, and I think there are 15 or 20 questions um, dealing with all kinds of different behavioral things. Okay. Um, can you please explain um, why, need, why we need 65% SVC to use an EMST? What happens if you use EMST and have less than 65%? Also, how often should EMST be recalibrated? Yeah, so it, the reason that, um, that we use the 65% and um, uh, Emily Plowman and her research down at University of Florida, who, and she's done a lot of research with EMST, they recommend the 65% cutoff because other than if, if you're breathing, it, score is less than that, it's too fatiguing. Like it's just gonna make you more tired than it's than be helpful. Um, you just don't have the, the respiratory um, strength and reserve to, to make it worth doing the exercise. Um, and we think you should recalibrate um, like every week is what we suggest, um, just to be sure that you're getting sort of the most out of the device and the exercises. Okay. I don't see anything else that has come in. Uh, so there is one question here. Uh, my mom over the past two years continues to decline. Initially she had bulbar palsy. Now the doctor is calling it ALS. Her symptoms are only upper body. <coughs> no function in her arms, hands. Um, we can have Dr. Loman her. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, go to that question. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, Mary wants to know, how do you recalibrate? Um, I can't really show you without the device. Um, sorry. I think um, if you're using this device um, with a speech pathologist, you can have them show you. We like to recalibrate because frequently the patients don't do it right. And again, then they're getting, they're not using the device um, in the way that it's intended. Um, there may be a, a video online that shows you how to calibrate. I'm trying to remember. Um, but yeah, for, even in virtual visits, um, the, the clinician should be able to walk you through doing it with your device. Um, again, it's optimal if at least once you're in person. Um, 
<coughs> to see hands on and, and so the clinician can make sure that you're doing it accurately. <coughs> Excuse me. That's okay. Um, any other questions right now? <clears throat> I don't see anything else that has come in. So thank you um, for your time. And uh, sorry about the beginning with the slides. That was kind of no, crazy. No, <laughs> I'm sorry for the gentleman who couldn't hear. I, I, I know. There wasn't anybody else who had the same situation. <laughs> I don't think it was on my end. But. No, I think you were good. All right, Paige, <laughs> thank you very much for your talk. We'll see you later. Thank you for the questions, everyone.